Well, welcome back to the class and welcome to those of you watching by DVD. This is session 41. Today we're going to be talking about possible spiritual gifts. In the last session we talked about similar spiritual gifts and I tried to explain some of the differences between gifts that are often confusing for people because they sound very much the same. In this session we're going to talk about six spiritual gifts that many people have suggested are spiritual gifts. I'll explain what they are and then I want to explain why I do not think that they are spiritual gifts. Well, in the New Testament there are 27 different books. And have you ever wondered how those books came to be chosen as the books that would be in the Bible? You see, there were many different uh, papers that were circulating among the church. There was a Gospel of Peter. There was a Gospel of Barnabas. Why didn't those make it into the Bible? And there were many others that were written during that time that people thought perhaps should be included in the Bible. By 100 AD, 100 years after the birth of Christ, all of the books that are now in the Bible were being circulated among the church. Everyone had uh, heard about them, everybody had read them, and all of them were universally accepted except for six books. The books of Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, uh, 2nd and 3rd John, and Revelation. These were books that not everyone believed were part of the uh, New Testament. But between the years of 100 and 400 AD, there was a lot of discussion about the different books and by the year 400 all of the six books uh, that had been disputed were now included in the 27 books that now form the New Testaments. The others for various reasons were discarded. Not that they aren't important but that there were some problems within those books that made the people of uh, the early church believe that they should not be included in the actual Bible. And what criteria did they use? How did they decide this one will be in, this one will be out? Well, they had five criteria. The first thing that they considered is who wrote the book? Was it an apostle or was it someone who was not an apostle? If you were not a, an apostle, uh, like uh, Timothy, that didn't mean it wouldn't be included. It just meant that there was more authority if you were an apostle. The second criteria is, was it being read aloud in the churches? During the weekly services, was, were these books being read? Which ones were being read the most? The third one was, as you looked at the book, were there internal inconsistencies? Were there problems? Were there contradictions where at one part it said one thing and then later it said something else? If they found any contradictions, if it wasn't consistent, then they removed that book from consideration. The fourth criteria was that did it generally reinforce the con consensus beliefs of the early church? By the year 400, the church had a set of common beliefs about the religion of Christianity. If a book had been written and it violated any of those beliefs, it was set aside. And then finally, number five, was it written during the time of uh, the apostles? It had to have been written until the last apostle died, which was the apostle John. If it met all five of those criteria, then it was included in the book. And therefore, we have 27 books in the Bible. Now, translating that into spiritual gifts, what are the criteria to determine this one is a gift, this one is not a gift? Why have I included some, but I left others out? Well, I used only three criteria. First, it had to be listed by name in the New Testament. If it had been in the Old Testament, it could not possibly have been a spiritual gift because the spiritual uh, gift was given by the Holy Spirit which only had uh, indwelled believers after Jesus' resurrection. So any suggested gift that comes from the Old Testament cannot possibly be a spiritual gift. 
It might have been a one-time empowerment by God for a specific task, but it's not an ongoing gift. The second criteria that I used is, are there evidences of it being used today? I mean, do we see in the church, do we see in the larger world that this gift is still being used? And then the final one was the most important one. Is the gift linked to the English word charisma, the Greek word charisma? That is the word that indicates that there's supernatural power behind the gift. If that was not somehow associated, somehow linked with the gift, then I excluded it. So what are some of the gifts that have been considered over the years, but I don't feel that they are spiritual gifts? I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, describe what a person, according to those who support it, what a person would be doing with that gift, and then I'll tell you which of the criteria I believe it did not meet so that I excluded it. We're going to be using quite a bit of the Bible today, so get your Bibles out, get them ready, get your thumbs ready to go because we're going to go to quite a few places. First in the Old Testament, would you go to Exodus, second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 31, and beginning right at the first verse, and we will talk about a suggested gift, the gift of craftsmanship. And this is probably as close in the Old Testament as it comes to actually explaining that the Holy Spirit came upon someone, empowered them to do some special task. But here's the definition for craftsmanship. It is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for a believer to creatively construct or creatively design items that are used for ministry use. In many churches where they have dramas, props are put together that are used in the drama. And those would be designed and they would be crafted by someone who the churches who think this is a spiritual gift would say, God's in a way used that prop to really create the power of the drama that impacted people. I have seen in some churches where people have built a very, very large cross and it's not smooth, it's rough on the edges. And then when people um, are baptized, they t have written out their sins. And they come up and they pin those to the cross, literally saying, I give these sins to Jesus who has washed me clean and now I belong to him fully. I want everybody to know that I'm a Christian publicly and I want Jesus to take these sins away. People with this gift, according to those who believe it, say that people with the gift work with wood, they work with glass and metal, with paints and other raw materials. So they are truly craftsmen. And then they say that these people make things that increase or enhance the effectiveness of other ministries. They say that these people are skilled and they enjoy working with their hands, and that when they work with they, their hands, they meet tangible needs in the church. And then their fourth and final uh, consideration of people with this gift is that they're able to either design and construct or do the designing, others do the constructing, of items and resources for ministry use. Is there an example in the Bible that shows us someone using their gifts? And there is. And that's why I had you turn to Exodus chapter 31. Let me read uh, from 1 to 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tri of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Holy Spirit, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Moreover, I have appointed Ohelob, son of Ahiasmich, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given skill to 
all the craftsmen to make everything I have commanded you. And then he lists the things that are being commanded. You see, they are building the very first uh, tabernacle, the place that they would host uh, their religious services where there would be the outer court, the inner court, and then the Holy of Holies where God's Spirit dwelled among the people. And the only one who could go into the Holy of Holies was a priest. And he could only go in once a year. And when he went in, he had to do his business and then he had to leave the Holy of Holies. And there were various objects that were associated with the religious services. There were things that uh, cleansed the blood. There were things, the horns that were made. There were cups and chalices. There were different kinds of designs for the tabernacle. Curtains had to be uh, fabricated. They had to have hooks to hold them on poles. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant had to be placed in the Holy of Holies. There were many things that needed to be done. And in this situation, God said, I'm going to take Bezalel and I'm going to fill him with the Holy Spirit. And he and others will accomplish this task. Now, doesn't that sound an awful lot like a spiritual gift? In fact, if I was going to pick one that I say is the closest to actually being a spiritual gift, I would say craftsmanship is the one. So why did I not include it? Well, first of all, it's not listed in the New Testament. It's a one-time filling of the Holy Spirit for a specific task. You see, in the Old Testament, there are many times where the Spirit will come upon an individual one time for a specific task. You'll remember the story of Samson with his long hair being his power and eventually that hair gets cut and he loses his power and he asks God, oh, one last time, help me to have the strength to do your will. And he takes the pillars and he pushes the pillars apart and the whole temple comes down and many of the priests and believers in Baal are killed. God came upon him with a one-time filling of the Spirit to be able to do a supernatural task. But when that stopped, the Spirit left. Of course, Samson was dead, but it stopped with uh, Bezalel. He only had this one task. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit's with us always. So the other reason I crossed it off the list is there's nowhere where a similar Hebrew word as charisma is listed, a special uh, filling of the Spirit. There's just a listing that God did fill him with the Spirit. So craftsmanship is not a gift, I believe. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. There is a second gift that many people believe is a spiritual gift, and it's called creative communication. These are people who are skilled in the arts, in music, in drama, in writing, in singing, in the playing of instruments. The definition people use is to communicate God's truth through a variety of the art forms, including music, drama, singing, dance, etc. People with this gift, according to those who believe it is a gift, say that these people demonstrate in fresh ways how to present God's ministry and message to people. And they use variety and creatively to cause people to consider the gospel message. They say that they develop and then they use their artistic skills for ministry purposes. And then finally, their fourth point is they use their art to communicate God's truth to others. Now, let's look at a biblical reference where there are some people mentioned who use singing and the playing of instruments as part of worshiping God. Would you go to 2 Chronicles? 2 Chronicles comes after uh, the book of Kings, Samuel, Kings, and then Chronicles, and we're going to the second book of Chronicles and to chapter 5. And we're going to see an example of people who are specially designated to provide 
art forms for the worship of God. Starting in verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. And notice how the art forms are used in the worship of God. The priests then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves, regardless of their divisions. All the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Heman, Juratha, and their sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen and playing cymbals, harps, and, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. The trumpeteers and singers joined in unison as with one voice to praise God and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by the trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good, His love endures forever. And then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. So you see there are people who are using a variety of instruments, there are those who are singing, and their gifts are all being used to worship God. And as a result, there is an appearance of God himself in the form of a cloud, and the glory of the Lord fills the temple. So surely that must be a spiritual gift. I mean, God shows up. Well, why did I cross it off the list? First, it's not listed in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. And much like craftsmanship, it's a one-time occurrence and it doesn't get repeated. And it's not linked with any sort of a word that would indicate there was a special empowerment by God in order to be able to worship him. He did appear, but he appeared as a result of using the gifts. Not to instill uh, supernatural power to play the instruments or to sing in a way that would bring glory to God. So creative craftsmanship is not a gift in my opinion although others disagree, and that's okay. There is another gift. If while I'm talking, you will turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We will see another gift that people sometimes claim as one, and is called the gift of celibacy. It is the voluntary and willing uh, choice to remain single without regret, and without uh, engaging in uh, sexual activity and controlling of one's sexual impulses so as to serve God with greater distinction, with greater effort. So it's people who say, I am not going to get married. I will remain single for the rest of my life. And therefore, I will not have sexual activity with any man or with any woman and I will fully devote myself to the service of God. And Paul was one of those people. Down in verse 5 where Paul is speaking to married couples and he says, do not deprive each other of sexual activity except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession not a command. I wish that all men were as I am, celibate, single with no sexual activity. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that gift. So many people believe that that is a gift of celibacy. I believe that this is a gift that is not licked with charisma. There is the word gift but it is not charisma, which is the special empowerment of the Spirit to work through you to be able to remain single and to be able to remain celibate. There are people in the Protestant church who choose this course of action. And as I am now widowed, I have a choice of whether I believe God wants me to get married again or whether I should stay single for the rest of my life and to remain celibate and to focus on ministering on behalf of God. So this gift still exists today, 
but it is a choice. It is not a special empowerment. I believe it comes out of one's own will to say, this is how I choose to live. There is a, uh, another gift that is often mentioned, and we have talked about it before, the gift of martyrdom. And while I'm talking, if you will turn to the book of Acts in chapter 7, we're going to see a specific incident where one of the early believers was martyred. And people point to this and say, this in fact is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The definition is to give over one's life, to suffer or to be put to death for the cause of Christ. And people with this gift experience either extreme persecution or death from following Christ. They also voluntarily yield up their bodies in either extreme persecution or even on to death as a living sacrifice to further God's kingdom. And that's what happened with the stoning of Stephen. He has just given an impassioned and a very well articulated and reasoned argument to the Jews of why Jesus is the promised Messiah. And the people don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear that Jesus is the Christ. And so they listen. And while Stephen is highly persuasive, they do not believe. So let's go to Acts chapter 7 and down to verse 54, and we'll see the result of Stephen's impassioned uh, testimony of Christ as the Messiah and the rejection of Christ by his listeners. In verse 54, it says, When they heard this, what Stephen had been saying, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, which is the Bible's way of saying he died. Well, this certainly reminds us of Jesus and his sacrificial death. And Stephen was certainly a brave man. And it does say that he spoke to the Spirit, received my Spirit. It says that the Spirit uh, did come upon him and gave him the courage to be able to go through with this. However, martyrdom is a one-time gift. I mean, it isn't like you use it over and over and over again. You're stoned one time and it's over. And so there's not ongoing ministry that takes place. While there is extreme persecution and while there are people who even die for the cause of Christ today, I believe the fact that it is not linked to the word charisma means that all of us could experience this. Not one of us, not one of us watching can be promised that we will not suffer extreme persecution or even die for the cause of Christ. So I don't believe that this is a spiritual gift. We have just two more. And if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 3, we will talk about the gift of being a missionary. Ephesians chapter 3. And many people believe being a missionary is a spiritual gift, a special calling of God to go out and to minister effectively in another culture, which is the definition. And they say people with this gift voluntarily leave their own culture and they go to another culture to minister. And because of the Spirit's empowerment, they can make the transition smoothly and they learn a new language very quickly and they adapt to the customs of the new culture quickly. Well, in this biblical reference, people point to Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 6 through 8 where Paul is speaking first about the mystery 
that Gentiles are also included in the church. So in verse 6 he begins, This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, people point to that and they point to the fact that, well, Paul uses the fact that it is a gift of God's grace. And in this, he is saying it is um, a charisma, because the word does appear there. So why is it not a gift? I believe that it is an office that God calls some people to, just as he has called me to this ministry, and just as he would call you to other ministries. And it's not the role of missionary he's called, the, he has empowered them, but is the ability to preach the gospel, perhaps as a prophet or an evangelist, and to have an effective ministry among the people. So here's one where charisma is listed, but it's no different than our charisma that we would have with our spiritual gift. It's the role, not the gift. We have said that often apostles uh, are those sent forth as missionaries, and I believe the gift is one more of apostle. Finally and briefly, there are those who say that the gift of voluntary poverty should be considered. And the definition is to purposely live an impoverished lifestyle to serve and aid others with your material resources. People with this gift voluntarily give all their money and possessions away and, and become totally dependent on God's provision. And secondly, they voluntarily donate all of their wealth to help advance God's kingdom keeping only the minimum amount of money they need to survive. Do you remember the story of the widow's might that we talked about in a previous session where the woman went to put in two very small copper coins and Jesus said, others gave out of their wealth. This woman gave all she had. And people point to that and say that it was voluntary uh, poverty. I believe that there is no word charisma that is listed there, and I also believe that it is a choice, as celibacy is a choice, as going out as a missionary is a choice that we make, and it is not a gift that is given to people. Well, in review, we've talked about six gifts that I believe are not gifts of the Holy Spirit. Craftsmanship, creative communication, celibacy, martyrdom, missionary, and voluntary poverty. I understand that there are people who believe they are, and we welcome diversity of opinion in the church, but in my opinion, these are things that, while very good and very noble in the cause of Christ, are not special enablements, special empowerments of the Holy Spirit to do the work of ministry. Well, please join us next time when we're going to begin to take a look at Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16, and we're going to give an overview of the entire section before we go back for the next two sections and split that section apart to really understand what it says. Please join us. <music>